G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. The national championships are over. Toomey's done his first phantom form guide for the year, so I thought it was a good time to have a crack at doing another top 20 mock draft. Now it is July and so much can change, and frankly so much has changed. And I'm looking a lot at the top end of this uh, draft order that I've got here, and not only will the order of teams change, but like, I feel like it's so even in the top half of half a dozen or so, and I feel like we're really not locked in. So who's going to go pick one, which makes it one of the more interesting drafts in some time. So since I did my last one, we do have a new team holding pick one in Richmond. And the ladder order has changed as well, so it'll give it a little bit of a, a different look. And I did sort of say this the last time I attempted a mock draft, but it, that's actually struck me the depth of tools that are available in this draft. It is known broadly as a midfielder's draft, and that is true of the top six or seven or you know six of the top seven or so perhaps or even looking at it it might even stretch down to the top dozen or so there's probably only one tall but past that there is a, a mountain of good quality talls that could really bolt as the season goes on. And we've seen a number of talls sort of probably move up the rankings. Harry Armstrong is probably the biggest example of that with the great championships. And as the season goes on, as players continue to grow and their draft combine results, I feel like so much is up in the air, but it doesn't mean it's still not fun to do a mock draft this early. So I've mixed it up a little bit from last time. We're gonna go through one all the way through to 20. Later in the year, I'll start doing longer mock drafts. For now, if you do me a favor, if you want to see more draft content or footy content in general, I would love it if you subscribe to the channel and help me get to 30K by grand final day. All right, let's start with pick one. This is now Richmond's. Does that change who is likely to go pick one? Probably not of them by itself. I feel like Richmond are a team, you know, kind of starting their rebuild now. Missed a couple of years of draft picks and therefore have a relatively blank canvas around the sorts of player that they're going to pick. That being said, the question over who goes pick one, even if the draft was held today, I feel like it's so open-ended. We had Josh Smiley. He's probably been the consensus one for a little bit. That changed a little bit in the championships when he wasn't quite as effective. I'm still going to go Smiley here. The reason being, I just haven't seen enough from other candidates here to leapfrog him because there's so many candidates here in the top handful of players that have some sort of question marks. You got Levi Ashcroft, he's gonna be an academy pick. You got Finn O'Sullivan, he sort of missed the early parts of the year with a, with an injury. Same thing with Sid Draper, Sid Draper finished the championships really well. Then there's some bolters like Sam Layla, Harvey Langford, etc. But I'm gonna go with Smiley at the moment because I feel like from a traits point of view and a player profile, he's probably the one that Richmond can look at and say, we can build a midfield around him because he's got a massive point of difference being six foot five or something like that, which is likely to grow to being a six foot six midfielder. And I don't think his chance was bad. I think he was probably a victim of having to play forward a little bit. Sometimes when you have these stacked midfields, some players need to play in different positions. Maybe Smiley just isn't a particularly good forward, but he is a very good inside midfielder. And I'll, I'll keep it that way for now, but I'm not convinced that that's going to be the way that it falls on draft day. At pick two, we got North Melbourne. I'm going to bid on Ashcroft here. Last time I did it at pick three. The reason being is, well, I, I suppose part of the fact is I just saw Toomey ranked him as the number one player. It doesn't really matter where we put him, um, but there's also the connection with North Melbourne who did bid on Wheeler Ashcroft, if I'm not mistaken. So let's just say Ashcroft goes at pick two. It may or may not go that way. And then North picks really hard. And the thing is with North, I think their, their needs are really not midfield based. I think they're tall based. So there's an incentive there to split the pick, which is another variable in this. I'm gonna keep it as the same draft order. And therefore I'm just gonna select who I think is the best available player. And that is Finno Sullivan, who is a really hardworking, impressive midfielder, probably my favorite midfielder in the draft. I'd have to say at this current point in time, really good over hard head mark, good skills, good running capacity. I think he's a great fit for West Coast, but he just goes one pick earlier to North Melbourne. Like I said, if I'm North Melbourne, I'd be trying to be creative with this pick and maybe get access to some of the tools later in this draft by splitting the pick, which puts West Coast on the board. And as a West Coast fan, I'm not really super confident about who I want yet. I've got a few faves for sure. Hey guys, just a quick note to let you know that this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. You know, since I got back to the UK, I've been thinking a lot about mental health. Personally, I had a lot on my mind and it's got me thinking a lot about how this specific lifestyle that I choose, where I'm very dedicated to making content, etc., right now, the unfortunate byproduct of that is that it's made me feel very socially isolated. And that can be difficult when you have a lot on your mind. And, you know, some people might be able to relate to that. And for others, they might not feel socially isolated as such. They might be surrounded by loved ones, they might be surrounded by friends, but, you know, sometimes people just don't want to feel like a burden if they want to talk to people about the way they're feeling. I think there is a lot to be said for being able to verbalize the way. Way that you're feeling. Sometimes it's not even just about problem solving the issues that you have in your life. Sometimes it's just about getting that negative energy that you have inside of you 
out of you. This is where therapy in general, but BetterHelp specifically, can come in and add a lot of value to your life. It's basically a platform that matches you with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. If you wanna check out more info, check out the link in the description of this video and the pinned comment, or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. You'll fill out a questionnaire to assess your specific needs. Then they'll match you with a therapist with years of experience at helping people just like you. And usually you will get matched with a therapist within 48 hours. And then scheduling your sessions is really easy and you can do it by a phone call, you can do it by a video chat, whatever is the most convenient for you. It is literally the most convenient way to seek therapy. Let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can help you today. And if you use my link, like I said, betterhelp.com forward slash true footy, you will enjoy a special discount on your first month as well. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. I'm gonna go with Sid Draper. I think this pick is so open-ended and I think Draper's end to the championships coming back from injury was really compelling. He looked to get back to full fitness. I think he had 27 touches for South Adelaide senior team recently. And uh, he's just a small but competitive and fast little midfielder that had a, a fantastic season last year. And I think ESPN just rated him their number one player. So it's so subjective and, and really hard to cross-reference these things. But I'd be pretty happy if West Coast went Sid Draper here. I previously picked a tall for them, but I think midfield is where it's at. And Sid Draper goes at pick four. So now we've got St. Kilda. And I think St. Kilda you know, over the last couple of years, we've been looking at midfielders. And in particular, I think it'll be a midfielder with some pointed difference. I think I had them taking Jagger Smith in the first one, but I'm going to get them to take a bolter in Sam Layla, who's 187 centimeter midfielder forward. And he's shown an ability not only, you know, being powerful at stoppages, but also swinging forward, taking marks. And I think that pointed difference, that two-dimensional type of midfielder forward is something that will appeal to St. Kilda to avoid having too much of a same, same-ish midfield, which is probably true of their last generation. Sam Layla is probably still an outside chance for listening to people who are smarter than me about the draft to be the number one pick. I think it's that even at the moment, and I think St. Kilda would be happy to take Sam Layla. So then we move on to the Adelaide Crows here, and I think their needs are... Oh, uh, they'd probably still be looking for a midfielder with some sort of point of difference. And Sid Draper's off the board. Who, that's who I had them taking previously. So I've got them taking Harvey Langford, who again is a massive bolter. And he was the joint winner of the Lark medal with Leonardo Lombard as well for a great championships. And he's got that point of difference. He's six foot three. He's strong. He can mark overhead and he can slice hands up with his foot skills. And I think that he's a little bit Jordan Dawson-like in that sense. And I think Adelaide could use a little bit more of that. Then we've got Hawthorne. And again, this pick is probably academic as well because there's a chance they trade this pick for Bailey Smith. Now, what a Hawthorne need. I don't think they're desperate for midfielders when they've drafted heavy in that role. I mean, I'm sure their views on Bailey Smith are different. I think they'll see him as a bit more of a match winner and also pretty ready-made. Hawthorne also have issues in their back 50 in, well, in terms of structure, and they could probably use another tall defender. And Luke Trainer is the best available one at this pick. Now, He's good defensively. He's probably a bit more of a Jordan Ridley type. That's who he's been compared to. So he's decent defensively. Probably not going to take on your 200 centimeter key forwards. So maybe Hawthorne take this pick in trainer and then double down with another key defender who's a bit more equipped to take on those guerrilla forwards. They could take both because Trainer has some really good offensive weapons as well and that kind of would really consolidate Hawthorne's list. I think they added heavily to their forward line. I think they drafted well for their midfield in the past and their back line could take a double hit here, taking Trainer and potentially another taller a little bit later. So now we're up to the Fremantle's first of their three picks at pick eight. So I'm going to go Jagger Smith here. And, um, you know, there's some mixed opinions on Jagger Smith. I've seen, um, I think ESPN rated him number two, and I've seen him plummet down other boards. And for me personally, he is such a prolific and quality ball winner. It, it's hard to ignore. So this is kind of a best available point of view, even if I don't know if he is 100% suited to Fremantle's needs. But looking at Fremantle and having these three picks, assuming they keep these three picks, they're probably happy for a balance and that gives them, you know, the, a bit of license to take best available. They'll have some targets further on, but maybe they just go the best available ball winning midfielder here in Jagger Smith. So now I've got Gold Coast current two picks. Now it's, to me, it's certain that they're going to trade these picks. Um, you know, the first one I'll say they might take Toby Travalia. Travalia is another player who's bolted. I don't think I had him in my top 20 last time I did this video, but he is, well, he's compared by Toomey to Will Day. He's a bit of a 
mark and kick kind of defender. He's got really good skills by hand in particular. And he's got capacity to play on the wing and potentially one day on the ball. But at the moment, if we're looking at him and isolating him as a really skillful intercepting defender with a bit of running carry, then I think that would suit Gold Coast who, with their academy picks over the years, probably haven't taken a player of this type. I think he's very different to Will Graham and Lombard, who they're going to take very soon, Jed Walter and Ethan Reid. Like this is diversifying what they've got. I think Travaglia stands out and he's very close to best available. So I think he's another player that could rise up the ranks. Now at pick 10, I'm going to get them to take their own academy players. It's only academic at this stage. He could go earlier than this. Again, I've seen some diversified opinions. Toomey has him at 11. I've seen other people have him bid on at about pick three or four. Let's just assume that this pick gets absorbed for Leonardo Lombard, and I think this would be a bargain because I think he could easily be in the top handful of selections on quality in this draft. He's a little bit small at 178 centimeters, but he's got this real presence and an ability to play above his level. Like he played in the VFL grand final at 16. He was also the joint winner of the Lark medal. So uh, that's a really good case for why they will absolutely snap him up. So then we got Fremantle's sec second selection here. And this is probably where they go homegrown talent. And Bo Allen is probably around this range. He's 191 centimeters. Bit of a running defender originally. He's actually a pretty good athlete, pretty good speed. Whereas now I think, you know, his evolution will probably be into a running midfielder as well. He's another player that's being compared to Jordan Dawson. I think maybe production might be an issue for Bo. In terms of winning the ball 25 to 30 times in a game as a midfielder, that's something he's got to develop. But in terms of an athletic profile, first of all, he's very different to Jagger Smith. And potentially he could start his career down back for Fremantle and at least be that fast outlet player while he develops into a midfielder. Then we've got the Melbourne Football Club. This one will be an interesting pick. Again, what do you do? Like last year they took uh, Windsor, they took Tholstrup, and you got the sense that they just wanted to take the guys that they wanted to take. I think the feedback on my last one, and I can't remember who I gave Melbourne in the last one, but there was a feedback that maybe they go forwards, and I made the point in that video that they took Jefferson, they took Van Royen. I don't know if there's a pressing need to take a key forward, so I've gone with the best available midfielder, and they're still going to be looking at a midfield transition down the track as well. So I've got them taking Murphy Reed, who is admittedly a small bodied midfielder. He's pretty versatile and very silky and classy. And another player that has bolted in terms of perception, Toomey ranked him at number five. That's the only place I've seen him ranked that highly, but a very clever player, very, very skillful with his moves. And he's an exciting player. And I think on a best available point of view, Melbourne would be happy with that. But I think there's, you know, there's also a little bit of a blank canvas for where they're at. And I think he would complement the other sort of players that they've drafted in drafts in recent years because they have gone pretty draft heavy over the last few seasons, Melbourne. So we've got GWS. They're a hard one to pick because they notoriously just sort of pick off their own draft board and they're pretty concerned with the go-home factor. And I don't know if Taj Hotton would fit that criteria. However, probably just about there on a talent basis and perhaps need as well. I think they could be looking at their next midfield transition. And we know they've got um, Rouston and obviously Tom Green and Callahan. I think they're pretty sweet for talls. Um, you know, they've got Aaron Cadman developing as well. So I don't know if a key forward or key player is what they need. I'd go Taj Hotton here because not only is a midfielder, but he's versatile and he can play off a half forward flank, but he's got the running capacity and ability to accumulate the ball further up the field as well. But he's also a goal kicker. If he hadn't done his injury, I think it was an ACL, wasn't it? He's got a season ending injury. He could potentially go high. He just started to really raise his stocks as he was playing before he got injured. So he's a huge question mark on where he falls, but I've got him to GWS for the time being. So then we move to the Essendon Football Club. I've got them taking their own academy player in Isaac Carco. Look, it's, a, it's very easy to make the connection there because he's an academy player and you kind of assume there's a relationship there. Perhaps the smart thing to do would be wait to see if he gets past 20. As it currently sits, I don't think Carco gets through past 20. As it currently sits, just my personal opinion. And therefore, if they want this guy, they're going to have to take him here. But I also think from a list needs point of view, it also makes sense having looked further at their list and the sorts of players they've recruited in recent times. You know, last year they took a key forward, a couple of running defenders. I think what Essendon could use is a player that can really provide pressure and spark in that forward line. But further to that as well, the thing I like about Carco is you could probably see him slotting into a team round one next year and just applying pressure. You can do that as a small bodied player. And given where Essendon's at, they, they will probably value a relatively ready-made player because he brings a lot of energy, defensive pressure, He's pretty good around goals. At least he gets opportunities. He's a little bit wayward this year. I think he kicked like 15 goals, 23 or something. But nonetheless, I think it's a good fit for Essendon. Am I being lazy there? You tell me. But I think that one makes sense. So then we've got Fremantle, another team that I think will be on the market 
for a pressure forward. And I think I had them taking this guy last time in Joe Berry. So at pick 15, Fremantle, Joe Berry. I really like this one. He's a very classic, high pressure, hard running, defensive foot sort of small forward who also kicks goals. And when you consider they lost Lockett Schulz and Walters as a small forward, obviously towards the back end of his career, maybe they got another partner in crime for Switkowski who's doing really good things at Fremantle. But I think this pick really makes sense. And I think Fremantle again will pick a player here in Berry who could potentially play round one. Pick 16, we've got the Geelong Football Club. Now, again, who knows if they hold this pick? I think the, my personal opinion, it's probably getting traded for Bailey Smith, um, amongst other things perhaps, but we'll say for now that Geelong hold pick 16. I reckon they could go tall. So last year they took uh, Conor O'Sullivan and Mitch Edwards, but I still think maybe a key forward to you know really consider for the future behind uh, Tom Hawkins, obviously Jeremy Cameron. They've got Shannon Neal, I know that, but I think maybe Jack Whitlock would be a good selection here. A 200 centimeter key forward, I had an early season game where he kicked four goals, four from 20 possessions against uh, Tasmania. And again, I feel like these tours are gonna fluctuate and I don't know exactly where he sits, but he has slid a little bit down my ranking due to so many moving parts at the moment. But I think that would make really good sense for them to pick a key forward. And they have some options. It doesn't have to be Whitlock, but I think that one makes sense. And then we get to Carlton. Now, I want to say at this point in time, last time I had a, a, one of the Camprioli boys, Ben Camprioli, in my top 20, I also had Adelaide's Tyler Welsh. Now, I have no idea how likely it is those guys get bid on this early. I like them as prospects. I thought they would by now. I am sort of going to go off Toomey's ranking here. He had none of those players in the top 30. So rather than being lazy and just getting Ben Camprioli here again, which is possibly the pick they would use to give him up, let's just assume that they're still on the board and Carlton actually have a free pick here. I will probably go Harry Armstrong here because what, what do Carlton need? I'd say probably Tall's, maybe not, I don't think they need it. I think their list is actually pretty balanced, but you know, key forward or key back. Mackay and Kerno, obviously the best one, two key forward punch in the competition, but they're what, 26? Um, so you think about what that's gonna look like in four or five years when a key forward prospect in this year's draft might be 22, 23. So when you consider that Carlton have two midfielders slash wingmen in the Camprioli boys in this year's draft, I think this frees them up to go tall with this selection. So with all that being said, Harry Armstrong, he's one of the biggest uh, bolters in terms of pre-championships rankings to where he is now. Kicked three goals against South Australia, kicked five goals in the same week, I think, against Vic Country. And given his athletic profile, he's very quick, very agile. Again, another player, if he tests well, could go higher than this. I think Toomey had him like 13th. So he's around the mark for this selection. I think Carlton would snap him up here. So as it currently stands, Sydney have the next two selections. Who do they go? Again, I've made this point before, they're notoriously hard to pick. Uh, four because I feel like they are a little bit out there with their selections and it works for them That's not a criticism. I'm just saying sometimes I'll pick random players So when they got two picks in a row that creates plenty of potential for them to just go rogue with these selections However, I think they're in a position to go one tall one small. That's the way I've gone with this last year They took a ruck. They also had an academy midfielder so maybe they don't need to keep adding midfielders. I think they've got some depth there. Caden Cleary is obviously the most recent example. Angus Sheldrick's still at that footy club as well. So I don't know if there's real need for that. But let's start with the, the tall. And I think it makes more sense to go defender than forward. I know they got Patrick Snell in last year's draft, and I don't really know how that's going. He was a pick in the 40s. Maybe they can double down on that. And obviously, I think there's a little bit of a list weakness there with key defenders. I'm going to go Matt Whitlock. Now, the thing with Matt, he may have been considered a key defender not that long ago. He's moved forward now and shown an ability to kick goals in the forward line as well. So that's only a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But I think Sydney will be selecting a genuine key defender here. So maybe they go Matt and decide on him as a key defender. But I think from a needs point of view, a 200 centimeter key defender adds something different to what they currently have. I think Snell was around 194. You know, McCartan's 193, Hamling's still 194. I mean, again, this we're really talking about three or four years in the future, but I think Whitlock from a needs point of view makes sense from the Swans. So then who do they go with their second pick? Well, they could pick another key defender, to be honest. That would probably be excessive actually. So I'll say I'll say they'll take best available in my opinion. It's a, it's a midfielder, but he's a lot more outside. So therefore differentiated from a lot of what they've got. And I'll say Christian Moraes. Now Moraes has slid a little bit. He is a very attacking goal kicking wingman. And I think he had a game where he kicked like four goals from 25 touches or something earlier this year. So he's dangerous, but his ball use can let him down. So that's the only reason he slid. Whereas I think end of last year, they were talking about him as probably top six to eight prospect. 
So we'll see where that lands, but I think Marais does add something different to Sydney. I mean, they're so blessed at the moment with the talent, both young and old, on that list, so it's hard to really pick out any needs, but I think Marais adds something to it as a point of difference to this team. So finally, we've got a Gold Coast selection here, and again, are they going to hold this pick? They've got academy picks and trading and... Maybe this belongs to Richmond, I don't know. But let's assume that Gold Coast are now picking here. And they've gotten Lombard, they've gotten Trevalia. They took Walter, Graham, Ethan Reed, and Jake Rogers last year. So one thing they don't have necessarily in that age bracket is a key defender. So this, there's, heaps, there's heaps here. And I'm going to take Harry O'Farrell. Now, Harry O'Farrell, I don't think featured in Toomey's top 30. But I still think probably a 10 to 30 prospect based on what I've seen. It's early days, but another 196 key defender who is genuinely good as a defensive stopper. He's got really good closing speed. He flies for pack marks. I quite like him. So, you know, if you don't want to take him Gold Coast, let him through to Gold, uh, West Coast pick 23 or whatever it is. But I think this would be a good needs-based selection, and I think this is right smack bang in the middle of his draft range as it currently stands. Anyway, guys, that is my take on the top 20. This is, you know, so early, really. Um, so don't hold me to it. There's still so much to go. There's the rest of the season. You've got the draft combine. Then we've got all the trades to consider, moving ladder position. But it's still fun, right? You still get to have a little bit of a glimpse and project who might be available for your club. And that's the interesting part for me. And when I sat down to do this, I really didn't know who I was going to pick for West Coast. And uh, I feel like my mind is going to change a lot, but it's the nature of this year's draft and it makes it a little bit more interesting. So let me know in the comments what you thought of this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.